Hello everyone and welcome to my channel where we talk about everything grad life, grad advice, and research. In today's video, we are going to answer the age-old question, what is a PhD and why you should get one? So if you're interested in learning how a PhD can help you, or just really interested in the details and a basic overview of what a PhD is and how it works, then stay tuned. So what is a PhD? In its simplest form of a definition, it's the highest level of education you can get in any given field. And so there are a ton of doctoral programs or doctorates that a person could get. Some that you might be most familiar with would be an MD, a medical doctor, or a DDS, which is a doctorate in dentistry. And generally, a PhD is a doctorate in philosophy or a philosophy doctorate, depending on what country you live in. So a PhD or a Phil D or a D Phil. So a PhD is a broader type of degree that incorporates any type of discipline that really develops theory and thinking about how the world works or in ways in which the world works. While research is a part of all forms of academia, even as young as elementary school, what you're doing in a doctoral program is a little bit different because you're no longer just researching or understanding what other people have done or said. Instead, this is the opportunity for you to create knowledge, to be innovative and add content and research to the field that you're interested in. I mean, the Greek root of philosophy is love of wisdom. So it shouldn't be a surprise that there are a ton of different types of PhDs you can get from art history to engineering to anything in between. So the difference between maybe a PhD in a STEM field and a PhD in art history is that while a STEM field will still do some theory, you're also going to gain some really practical skills that would be relevant for working in a lab after you graduate. And I'm not trying to say that an art history PhD is completely impractical. They're just different types of skills and different types of thinking that you're being trained to do when you're in a more humanities, social science based PhD versus a STEM field. Then what do you actually need to do to get a PhD? Now that can look different for any PhD program depending on your discipline or your country, but in the US, specifically thinking about the humanities, a brief overview would be coursework, exams, field work, dissertation, defense. Another important aspect of what a PhD is, is what you are doing during this program. One really cool part about getting a PhD is really not that important, but I think definitely worth mentioning. Once you graduate from a PhD program, you get to be a doctor. Again, maybe you won't be doing surgery, but that gives you the professional title doctor. Or if you write your name out, it would be your first name, your last name, comma, PhD at the end. But also you get fancy regalia, like a PhD hood and gown, which look completely different than your undergrad, high school, and even master's regalia. There are some perks that, again, might be a little more shallow, but definitely in your hardest time might motivate you to keep going. Okay. Now there's fancy regalia, completely different ceremony, and you're engaging with research in a completely different way. Then what do you need to do to get there? Your first few years in a PhD program will probably feel really familiar to your master's program or your undergraduate program. You're expected usually to take a certain number of years of coursework. For my program, it's two years of coursework. And the purpose of taking coursework is one, you want to fill any gaps that you might have missed in between undergrad and your PhD. Since it's not always necessary to get a master's before a PhD, it's important that there are some courses that you take well in your PhD program to make sure that everybody in your department or in your discipline is caught up on a level playing field. Generally, you can think of these courses as foundational to your department, your discipline, or even your research project. And of course, there's ways to be strategic on what courses you take, but for the purpose of this video, I'm not going to get into that. After you've completed your coursework, then you'll probably go through a series of exams. And these exams, again, look very different depending on your department, but for my program, we needed to complete a language exam, meaning we had to demonstrate reading knowledge of another language that is in English. 
and then you'll most likely have comprehensive exams. And these exams are put into place so you have time to read, but also most importantly, demonstrate command over your research field and dissertation topic. And every PhD almost always has a written exam and a sort of oral defense. Now these can take different forms and be at different moments of your PhD process, but they are almost always included. Then after you've successfully completed your exams, then you advance to candidacy. And that could be ATC or ABD, which stands for advance to candidacy or anything but dissertate. And this means that you are no longer a PhD student, but now you are a PhD candidate. So before in your coursework and before your exams, you're learning what does it take to become a researcher? How do you ask questions? How do you investigate questions and think about contributing new knowledge? But after your exams, you become a candidate to become a doctor. So now you have been given kind of like a permit to do your own research, develop your own knowledge, and accumulate it into a document called a dissertation. Another important thing to mention, at this point, there aren't any more grades. So once you're done with coursework and starting at your exams, everything from that point on becomes pass or fail, which can help take some of the stress off. But essentially now it's, do you have command of this knowledge? or don't you? So once you get to your exams, it becomes less of how well you know something and rather, can you do it? Yes or no. So once you've advanced and became ABD or ATC, it is now your time to actually engage in research that is completely your own. Before, during your coursework and during your exam process, you were just getting and learning the foundations of your department and your own research project or your dissertation topic. Now that you've passed all your courses and you've passed all of your exams, you have free reign to do what you think is best that will move the field forward. Now you're diving into your own research questions and you are searching for your own evidence or data. So how do you do this? Well, that's where the fun starts. Now you get to start in field work. Before I started my PhD, when I thought about a field work year, I can only imagine like the few PhD students I knew who were living extravagant lives in Brazil or going and spending some time in the archives in Amsterdam or living in, I don't know, the wilderness in Iceland. And so that seemed really exciting to me. While that might not be everybody's field work experience, What's wonderful about field work is you actually get to decide what is it, how is it, and where is it going to be? That's the moment you actually become a researcher. So if you've created your own research plan, you're going to your research site or going to your research community, and you're going to do the real groundwork. And that's really exciting because now you get to decide what are the questions that are going to be asked? What is the data that's going to be collected? How is that data going to be collected? And what does all that data mean? Your field work usually lasts anywhere to as short as a month to as long as a couple of years. So it's really about how you set it up so you can be successful and get the information and necessary data that you need to make a good quality research project. This is also a very vulnerable year because if you don't have grant funding or support from your school, then you do have to figure out how are you going to really pay for everything, your housing, your food, your expenses. While I haven't started my research year yet, I am really excited about planning it and thinking through what are the things that are necessary for me to live comfortably, be safe, but also do the research that I need to do in an efficient amount of time. So if you're interested about a video that focuses on planning your field work and how I'm working to fund it, then comment down below. So you've just completed your field work, you're feeling really pumped and really good about yourself. Now what do you do with all this information that you've just collected? Well, you write a dissertation. So for some of us in undergrad, we may have had a senior thesis. In master's, depending on what type of master's program you went to, you could have had a thesis, a capstone project, or a syllabus. At the end of most PhD programs, you have a dissertation. And again, it's really dependent on what program you're in and its particular requirements, but generally you can expect an 80 to 350 plus page document that is 
accumulating all the data, all the theory, all your ideas, all of your solutions and conclusions into one document, which is called the dissertation. This is generally your last year of your PhD program, and it doesn't necessarily have to be done on campus. You can go back to your hometown, you can stay where you were doing field work, or you can go back to campus. But generally, people are expected to finish their dissertation the year after their field work. Now, obviously, that doesn't happen every time, and there may be some consequences, like like losing funding or losing out on job opportunities if you push it back. But the time it takes to complete a dissertation can be as fast as six months to as long as four years, which I wouldn't suggest, but definitely it does happen. And as you're writing your dissertation, you will be submitting portions of it to your committee. And I'll talk more about your academic committee in a future video. So if you're interested in seeing that video, hit subscribe. Ultimately, they become the most important part of your PhD process. They're the ones who decide if you pass or fail. Another important aspect of the dissertation year is that depending again on your program or your discipline, you might defend your PhD. In my program, we defend our prospectus or research proposal. But in other programs, you write your PhD, you meet with your committee, and then they ask you a ton of questions to make sure that you've thought it through and that there aren't any holes in your research. And so that might be a part of your dissertation year or a hurdle before you get to graduate that is important to know about. So it can come before your dissertation or after your dissertation, but at some point you are going to have to defend your research ideas and what you're hoping to prove through your PhD. So you've completed your coursework, passed your exams, advanced the candidacy, completed your field work, submitted and defended your dissertation, and now the only thing left to do is actually to graduate. So if that's what a PhD is and what it consists of, why in the world would you want to do all of that? I think a real practical reason to get a PhD is job security. Because it is the highest level of education you can get in any field, you can always go back and do any job that you would have done with an undergrad degree or a master's, but now you're also opening the horizon to other opportunities. And a lot of people or naysayers would say, well, we can't all become professors, but I think it's really important to know Getting a PhD doesn't mean you have to be a professor. In fact, there are a ton of non-academic jobs that people with PhDs get. So I think as you get into a PhD program and you start to learn the things you care most about, more job opportunities start to expose themselves to you once you bring yourself into that world. You can become a professor, you can become a researcher for the government, you can work as a private or independent contractor depending on what your field is. And people generally respect your opinion, so there's also a level of not having to prove yourself anymore because you've already proved yourself for the many, many years you spent in college. And I think for me too, as a black Mexican woman who grew up in the South, there's something special about being called doctor. And I know that seems maybe a little shallow or not very important, but for a lot of populations that don't see themselves represented within academia, there's a level of authority and power, but also somewhat of validation and excitement that comes with being able to be a doctor. So while that might not seem like the most important part about becoming a doctor, I do think it's really worth noting that if you wanna become a PhD student or a doctor just to say that you've reached this level of prestige or have this title, I don't think that's completely bad. In fact, I think it's really valid. While I wouldn't suggest using a PhD to find yourself, I would say that while you're in a PhD program, it'll probably be the last time in your career or even your life where people are genuinely interested in your ideas, your innovative thoughts, creativity, and want to hear what you have to say, think about what you have to say, and provide feedback in a way that can be generative or supportive for you. So in a way, a PhD is a wonderful time to really focus and narrow in on the things you care most about. And again, it's a really long process that requires many, many years and a lot of research and dedication. So making sure that you're getting a PhD that you care about is so invaluable. And I think that's one of the reasons why I personally wanted to get a PhD. I had all these questions about Afro-Latinidad and art and culture and identity, and nobody seemed to be asking the questions or answering the questions that I had. 
So instead, I got a PhD because nobody else was going to do the work that I was interested in. And so for me, it became a really big passion project. I can't speak for every field, but I know for me, thinking specifically about museums and culture, I could work for UNESCO, I can work for ICOM, but I could also run my own nonprofit. I could be a professor, I could be a curator. And so there's all these different opportunities that had been open to me that I never would have been able to get if I just had an undergraduate degree in art history or if I just had a master's degree. But at the end of the day, a PhD may not be for everybody. So if you're interested in learning more about PhDs and grad life, hearing more grad advice and everything research, hit the subscribe button. And if you found at least two things valuable in this video, hit that thumbs up. And if there are any questions that I didn't answer, please make sure to comment down below so I can include them in future videos. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next week.